So I'm really excited to be here to talk about this important topic and uh, hopefully have an interactive discussion about it. Um, I'll just jump right in. Uh, so, you know, uh, I don't want to withhold the secret. So the, I'm going to say right off the bat that the default mode network is a group of discrete brain regions that are most active at rest and are involved in self-reflective mental processes. And it's also a very metabolically hungry region, uh, set of regions. So this is sort of the basic definition. Um, so today I'm going to talk about four different ways of, of looking at the default mode network. Uh, I'm going to go through some of its metabolic requirements and the way it develops uh, throughout the course of, 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 of human life and Alzheimer's disease. And finally, I'm going to talk about the how it relates to different psychiatric illnesses and um, what psychedelic medications can tell us about the default mode network because they preferentially deactivate it. So first I want to set the stage a little bit and um, just talk about uh, the metabolism of the brain. So on the left here you see um, the brain is extremely hungry and um, it uses about 20% of the body's meta metabol um, energy budget, even though it only comprises about 2% of the body mass. And, and so what is it doing with all this energy? Well, on the left here you can see um, the brain in different task states. And, you know, there's a lot of blood flow all over the place. And from one task to another, there's not a huge difference. They're very similar to each other, right? Go ahead. Sorry, what, what's up with the left plot that has like liver and heart and brain? What are we looking at? This is um, an old PET scan uh, of glucose metabolism. And so darker is, more darker is more metabolism. Yeah. Yep. And so the heart, you would think, I mean, that's very energetic. You know, it's very active, but the brain even more so. And uh, so all of that is, um, you know, supplied by the blood flow, which is being mapped here in this scan. <clears throat> and <clears throat> so this is, if you subtract one image from another, you can isolate what's going on in the brain that's specifically res uh, related to a certain activity. So, you know, if you're viewing a word versus reading the word, you subtract one state from the other, you get this ta task-evoked activity that's uh, specific to that task. But, you know, those task-evoked activities are only about 5%, maybe even as little as 1% of the total uh, brain uh, blood flow. So the question remains, the great mystery is, well, what is all of this background, ongoing, intrinsic activity all about? And that really is a great mystery that continues to be... Um, investigated. And uh, along with that, the question is, well, how much of this activity is part of our conscious awareness and how much is, um, is unconscious activity? And as in uh, 1890, William James kind of posed the question of, well, how much of our experience is uh, coming from our sensory input versus how much is uh, being generated from within our own minds? And so I think the default mode network kind of emerged into the cognitive neuroscience in the context of uh, a paradigm which was far more focused on these tax evoked uh, studies. And uh, so I'm going to run through, like I said, four different perspectives on the default mode network. Um, first of all, it can be seen as uh, the regions that become deactivated when uh, a, a task is engaged. Uh, secondly, it's sort of a metabolic resting state that has uh, peculiar qualities. Um, it's also a cognitive state, a mental state, where uh, self-reflection and uh, mental time travel, meaning like thinking about the future or the past, happens. In, in, uh, when those activities uh, are going on, the default mode network is preferentially activated. And finally, it's really important to talk about uh, the way in which uh, the regions of the default mode network, which are separated in, in, in space, are 
and coordinated through time in uh, what's called the resting state connectivity. So this is where we're headed. So first of all, uh, the task evoked, uh, task induced deactivations. Um, the default mode network was really hiding in plain sight in the data for decades, but people hadn't um, really considered what it might mean. Every time they did these task, uh, indu task evoked studies, the, the um, often do a resting scan beforehand as a control. And if you compare um, the task state to the resting state, regardless of what kind of task is being performed, the same regions will uh, deactivate going into the task. So they seem to be more active at rest. But what exactly are they doing at rest? And you know, how, what is the baseline against which to study the activity of the brain that's happening at rest? And so these were some of the conceptual problems that immediately came to the fore uh, when Shulman published this study, really bringing into focus the, the question of these deactivations. And so you can see here the regions that deactivate um, uh, the posterior cingulate cortex. This is sort of the front of the brain, the back of the brain, and this is a sagittal section looking at the, at the medial side of the, the brain. And so you have the posterior cingulate, the medial prefrontal cortex, and uh, the hippocampal formation is also important. So those are the three I want you to think about. Um, so before I get into the study that coined the term, I want to, um, it's really important that we understand what we're looking at. And when the brain is activated, it, rece it um, receives a lot more oxygen than it actually uses, which is somewhat counterintuitive. So we're going to walk through it. So if a subject looks at this um, the stimulus, so you have this visual stimulus, it's a very powerful, like a sledgehammer to the visual cortex. In response, the brain <clears throat> increases blood flow to the visual cortex. Glucose utilization is increased. But surprisingly, uh, it doesn't use as much oxygen as you would expect in relation to the amount of glucose that's being used. And so oxygen availability actually goes up in response to an activation in a brain region. And be, that's uh, largely because aerobic glycolysis is a mode of choice where they, they, it uses uh, glycolysis even in the presence of adequate oxygen to supply energy to these excitatory synapses. And <clears throat> because of that gap, um, the ratio of oxygen consumed to oxygen delivered is a, a metric that's used to, um, to see if there's activation or not. So in the case of an activation, the oxygen extraction fraction will, will actually go down because um, more is being delivered than consumed. OK? So in 2001, Rakel, in response to this Schult paper, the paper by Schulman, uh, published a default mode of brain function. And it showed that the brain at rest, uh, he kind of pulled together all this data showing that all these midline structures that well, are involved in the default mode network have very high blood flow at, at rest. And they consume a lot of oxygen as well and glucose. In the, in the, this is the PCC again. And um, nonetheless, uh, the oxygen extraction fraction at rest is surprisingly uniform throughout the brain. So um, despite the fact that different areas are using different amounts of oxygen, the gray matter has much higher demand, for example, the oxygen extraction fraction is, is, is totally uniform throughout the brain which um, implies that there's this homeostasis between the oxygen that's coming in and the oxygen that's being used. Um, so <clears throat> it doesn't seem that the activity that's happening is sort of the same type of activations that you would um, see in, in uh, normal task-induced act activity. And so that's why uh, Rakel sort of uh, refer to the default mode network as a metabolic kind of resting place for the brain, a kind of default setting, a default mode. And uh, he also kind of referred to it as the brain's dark energy, because you, you, we know that something important is going on here, and we're just not sure quite what, what it is. 
and uh, it was subject to a lot of speculation. And uh, later, uh, so Rakel's paper really spawned this whole field. Uh, many fields, you know, from, oh, of, uh, oh, sorry, there we go. You know, uh, from studies of disease, um, neurophysiology and cell biology, task-based uh, papers. So all these papers kind of uh, grew out of uh, Rakel's in initial paper. At least it formed a, a nucleus for this emerging interdisciplinary field. Um, so <clears throat> the default mode network is also, um, yeah, so right, you have this brain, the dark energy of the brain. And, uh, you know, people tried, started to uh, develop research protocols to analyze what kinds of activity are happening uh, in the mind when the brain is in this uh, default state. So what, is, you know, the brain is active at rest. You know, if you have the subject lie in the scanner and tell them not to think about anything in particular, a lot of stuff goes on in their head, right? It's not as though it, the, the, the mind goes quiet easily, as we all know. And so they teased apart some of the different functions, that ha the mental activities that happen when the default mode is activated, like when the mind is, um, is wandering, uh, there's a, a lot of uh, rumination, emotional processing, self-reflective activity. Some of the important uh, as aspects are uh, autobiographical memory, uh, thinking about your, your past, envisioning the future, sort of imaginative processes, theory of mind, your ability to understand what someone else is thinking, uh, moral decision making, kind of asking difficult questions that involve moral implications. So all of these very, um, all these processes are really essentially essential to uh, maintaining and constructing our sense of who we are in the world and building uh, the personality. And so let's, this has led some people to speculate on whether it constitutes a neural correlate for our internal sense of self or even the ego. Um, and I think that's an important concept, uh, but it's also important to note that it's very easy to both relate to the default mode network and understand it in a sense because of its uh, relation to our internal subjective experience, but it's also because of that maybe uh, very tempting to project onto it what we want to see in it. And so, note of caution. Um, but regardless of what it ends up turning out to be, it certainly has had the effect of repositioning the question of internal subjective experience into the um, research uh, agenda of cognitive neuroscience, which I think is a wonderful thing. Okay, so. I'm going to transition towards this um, fMRI data, and it's really important to understand what we're looking at in the fMRI data. So wh what does it measure? It's, it measures uh, the blood oxygen level dependent signal. And uh, that really means the ratio of hemoglobin that's oxygenated to deoxygenated at any given moment. And um, it's sort of like uh, you can, once again, it supplies, since the brain supplies more oxygen than it uses, it kind of floods the garden to water the flower. Um, the imaging can take advantage of the difference in, you know, the deoxygenated hemoglobin is responsive to the magnetic field while the oxygenated is not. So as those, the ratio changes, it constitutes sort of an endogenous contrast that is uh, read by the scan. So in response to a stimulus, you know, you have this, first you start to consume oxygen, and then the brain floods the region with, with fresh blood, and you have an increase in oxygen availability in those activated regions. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, you said the, uh, um, the one that responds to the magnetic field is the deoxygenated, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> you have, um, you know, in a, in a scan, you have a lot of signal, a lot of noise in the signal, excuse me. Uh, 
Um, there's artifact from motion, the, the breathing induces changes in the bold signal, the heart rate. Um, and there's also these ongoing spontaneous bold fluctuations. And uh, they're just pervasive throughout the signal. And they're low frequency, um, 0.1 to 0.01 hertz. Uh, so one every 10 to 100 seconds. And uh, for, for many years, they were just considered, like I said, noise and averaged out in the pre-processing to isolate the signal that we're looking for. But um, it turns out that these uh, spontaneous fluctuations are extremely correlated between functionally integrated networks. So for example, if you seed the, oh, oopsie daisy, there we go. If you seed the, a region in the, P, uh, the posterior cingulate, the PCC, and compare it to the fluctuations happening in the anterior, uh, the medial prefrontal cortex, the spontaneous slow pulsations in metabolic activity are tightly correlated with each other. So this allows, <clears throat> Uh, us to map essentially not only the default mode network, but all of these functionally integrated networks that have components that are separated in space, but then coordinated across time in there in, uh, by these slow pulsing, pulsations. Um, and there's some interesting, just there's a properties that are specific to these, um, what's called resting state network connectivity. They, it, it's continuous, it spans uh, con levels of consciousness. So they go on when you're asleep, when you're awake, um, they're present in different species. There's also a hierarchical organization of <clears throat> interconnections uh, of correlation between different networks with the default mode network occupying a sort of central role in, in, the, in the architecture of brain networks. So the default mode network emerges as this central um, hub in that regard as well. And uh, there's also diurnal variation of hippocampal involvement in the default mode network. So there's this kind of slow wave that's superimposed over these slow waves of, of bold fluctuation. Question. Yeah. Is the, uh, the uh, sort of absolute amount of oxygen used not as important as the ratio of oxygenated to deoxygenated? Um, well, they're, they're just different things, I think. You know, the fMRI is, the bold signal is sort of a floating metric, and it's not tied to the um, total metabolism. The PET scans are much better at isolating that, for example. And then there's also arterial spin labeling that you can do with the fMRI. But, um, I mean, it's, there, I, I think it's, it, is it, is it important, how, the total oxygen concentration? I mean, I just wonder, if, you know, if you've got more blood flow, then you might have the same, uh, you know, ratio of oxygen uptake, but more uh, absolute oxygen use in one area of the brain than another, and I just would think that would be significant. So I think the, the, the question is, is it reasonable to compare the units measured by the fMRI in one part of the brain and in another part of the brain? Maybe the ratios are the same, but the actual energy consumption uh. difference is very different. So how, how do you actually, you know, you have some color hues here. They're, they're over the whole brain. Is it reasonable to kind of put those colors on the same scale in different parts of the brain that might have different overall? Well, OK. I mean. What's, what's being correlated are the, you know, the, these fluctuations in, in the bold signal. So what's lighting up is not, uh, you know, brain activity per se. It's, it's you know, you, if you seed one region and, and find where else in the brain those spontaneous fluctuations are happening, those are the regions that, that light up. Do you understand what I'm, what I'm getting at? It's an impulse response to seeding some region of the brain. Yeah, you, so if you, if you seed any region of the brain and, and then look for co correlations with, with that in terms of those, those low-frequency oscillations, then, you, you, you know, 
you'll, f you'll find what functional network it's, it's integrated with on that level. Does, it, does, that make, does that answer the question, I guess? And um, so I, I was wondering, um, given the time that you're going to let uh, the person in the scanner resting, for instance, um, um, how, how the, the DMN will correlate with blood flow? Because over, over, over time, you expect that um, everything would be kind of uh, converging to the blood flow of that given person. Or am I completely misunderstanding? Because the dynamics of, of the, the neuronal activity is much faster than the dynamics of the, the blood flow throughout the system. And I'm just wondering if you measure um, this oxygen related to blood flow over a long period of time, does it converge to the perfusion of the person? Well, if you look at, so there's, you know, there's uh, changes in uh, blood flow in response to activations on the one hand, and then there's also these spontaneous fluctuations that are um, ongoing, whether there's, the act, there's activity or not. So I think these are two kind of often conflated issues. And, when it comes to the brain at rest, I think over a long, you know, when you take a PET scan, it's, it's a long image, you know, it's, it's a long duration. And I think that while there are changes in, uh, within the resting state, the point is that over, over the long period, um, there's a uniformity of oxygen extraction fraction. I think that's, that's does that answer the question? Are the spatial correlations fairly immediate, or is there a lag, and does that give some clues as to network topology? Oh, yeah. Um, they're pretty tight, but people have done uh, sort of parabolic interpolation to, to allow you to see if one is leading the other, and they have, uh, it does seem that there is directionality between voxels within networks. And that each, net, each network has multiple directions going on, and then between networks as well, there are uh, there's a, this lag structure that seems to, um, you know, provide a, a directionality to the correlation. So changes in bull signal is basically due to dilation and constriction of blood vessels, right? Well, it's both. It's both supply and demand. So you, you know, there's the use of the oxygen and there's the supply of the oxygen. And what the bold signal is just telling you is, you know, overall, what's that ratio? How much deoxygenated hemoglobin is in the system? I see you're mostly thinking about it from demand point of view that there's these couplings because demand is correlated with different parts of the brain. Well, um, I'm not sure that we the point we don't really know the the underlying uh, the relationship between these bold fluctuations and neuronal activity. That, that's like, that's not clear, which is an important point. And um, I think pointing out that, yeah, that, that maybe that answers some of the uncertainty here, is there's, um, it's certainly re related to metabolism and to the blood flow, but uh, how that, how, what's really causing those fluctuations, I don't think we, we really know. Um, okay, I'm going to try to keep going so I get through it. Uh, oh yeah, so that, uh, this is just sort of recapping. We have the task-induced deactivations, metabolic baseline state, this mental state, and then this network connectivity. Um, so you can further uh, subdivide the default mode network by seeding multiple regions into uh, functional subsystems that are uh, based on the strength of correlation between uh, nodes within the default mode network. And if you do that, you find that the PCC and the medial prefrontal cortex are sort of the most uh, correlated with other areas of, um, go ahead. So right, so in, a, in a, the MRI scan, you, you kind of have this three-dimensional grid, and each 
is, uh, box is a voxel, and if you by C, you, you preferentially choose one either voxel or region, and you take the spontaneous bold fluctuations in that region and compare that to the rest of the brain and see where there's uh, most tight correlations. That's what the seeding is. Sure. And there's other, yeah, there's other methods as well, but that's sort of the most intuitive, like. And if you do that, you find uh, these kinds of uh, functional subsystems within the, so it's not just one system, there's multiple parts. Um, uh, and as I was getting at before, the system, the, the, these um, resting state systems are not uh, totally isolated from each other. They're, um, in a dynamic relationship with each other, and they're constantly communicating with each other. And um, this diagram kind of demonstrates that o over a, a whole time series, there's, a on average, there's an anti-correlation, for example, between the attention network and the default mode network. But it's, it, it, the temporal dimension of, that, of those dynamic interplays are lost in the, uh, this representation. So I'm gonna play a, a, a video here that kind of shows over time, hopefully, yay. <clears throat> so you see, you know, you can take a, this, these resting state scans of, um, of patients who are unable to communicate or even unconscious and extract all of this intricate data about the way that these uh, relationships are changing both within networks and across networks over time and kind of connectivity motifs are forming and then fragmenting and reforming. And there's a lot of information. Uh, this is all derived from that spontaneous bold signal. And so this is really a huge field now of, for those who aren't familiar with it. And uh, another uh, important avenue is just mapping all the white matter tracks that connect the regions both within the default mode network. So these are kind of the anterior uh, and the posterior components, and this is the cingulum. Um, and there's all, uh, it, there's all kinds of uh, subcortical connections as well uh, that connect the cortical components to, to the deeper parts of the brain. So this is, this is all happening. Um, and now I'm gonna talk a little about development. So what happens in the brain uh, throughout the course of the life? Well. The default mode network is not a static thing at all, and it's uh, much more um, integrated with itself in adulthood than it is in childhood. And you can see that in these, uh, the difference uh, between the child and the adult, and, and there's much greater in, in adult than in children. Um, and just diagrammatically, you can see from a nine-year-old where the components of the default mode network are sort of isolated from each other. To a 13-year-old, they, they start to cohere until finally in adulthood, they're more, more or less a functionally integrated uh, system. And um, to the extent that the default node network can be conceived of as a uh, correlative of, our, of the self, that you can imagine how that along with all these other brain systems that are evolving <laughs> through, through time, it uh, is, is coming into a, a coherent system. And, but metabolically, it's also interesting to think about what's happening in childhood. The rate of aerobic glycolysis I was talking about before is much higher from age, you know, in the first 20 years of life than in adulthood. And um, there are important reasons for that. Um, the uh, Aerobic glycolysis has multiple advantages for the brain. For one, it's, it's a very fast way of producing energy. I mean, the disadvantage is obviously it's inefficient because by not passing the glucose down all the way through oxidative phosphorylation, you're getting only a couple ATP rather than, you know, a full 36. But um, so the advantages are that it's very fast. So in these excitatory synapses, um, the astrocyte and the glucose are, I mean, and, and, the, and the neuron are in this symbiotic relationship, and uh, there's, you know, changes in demand 
uh, for uh, basically when there's an excitation, glutamate needs to be cycled through the system and uh, uh, by uh, aerobic glycolysis can, can meet those quick changes in demand. Um, it can also, you can, uh, it, if you, it can shunt the, the carbon into this pathway that um, allows for biosynthesis of nucleic acids and lipids and proteins. So the um, aerobic glycolysis is a biosynthetic mode of metabolism, which is utilized by cancer cells, children, and even in the adult brain, parts of the brain that are constantly undergoing remodeling and learning are more likely to be uh, using aerobic glycolysis because it allows for rebuilding and pruning uh, to go on. Um, and it's also neuroprotective because it changes the redox uh, balance in such a way that can you know, neutralize reactive oxygen species. So these are some of the reasons why we think that these, uh, you know, in yellow you can see here that these are the regions uh, that are, you know, the, the PCC among them that are most uh, likely to use aerobic glycolysis. And um, um, in Alzheimer's disease, we see that the, the amyloid plaques uh, tend to precipitate precisely in the areas of the default mode network most densely. So, he, oops, um, here, you know, in the PCC, and in the medial prefrontal cortex, very dense uh, locations for plaque formation. And one uh, hypothesis that's uh, out there is that the um, precip precipitation of plaques essentially is um, without the protective, neuroprotective effects of aerobic glycolysis, that it may lead to an environment where the, the, the plaque formation is more likely. So, okay, now uh, I want to talk about depression a little bit. Um, in the, the healthy uh, default mode network, uh, there, is, there are these activities like uh, reminiscing and daydreaming that go on as we um, uh, apply an egocentric reference frame to the internal stimuli that are constantly happening and then assign a valence to those internal stimuli in the emotional centers in the, in the anterior side. Um, and, but this, the, in, in, in depressed patients, one of the consistent findings is that the default mode network in integrates uh, the subgenual prefrontal cortex, which is, um, kind of hijacks the whole functioning of the system in such a way that uh, the depressed patient is, uh, endlessly ruminating in a negative way and brooding and reflecting on, on the same thoughts and, and can't stop. So it seems that the addition of this particular um, region of the brain, which is itself uh, independently associated with affect-laden behavioral withdrawal, rewires the default mode network to, to you know, engage in these depressive uh, activities. And so, interestingly, the, the extent to which the, uh, the subgenual portion is, is integrated in the default mode network is predictive of uh, ketamine treatment response. So, you know, it could be that there are kind of multiple, uh, you know, phenotypes that could be teased apart by looking at it through this lens. Uh, um, another model for thinking about depression in terms of these network dynamics. Um, uh, it's important to be able to toggle between these task negative and task positive states. This is a, a paradigm where the default mode network is, is thought of as the task negative state, and then you kind of group together the, some of these other networks as into task positive um, networks. And in a normal healthy patient, you know, it's, it's this fluid toggling happens between recruiting the networks for external attention and then retreating into the you know, task negative state. But in depressed patients, they, they do find a tendency for the, from rest into the task state for the, def the default mode network, which is the task negative network, uh, 
to persist even when they try to uh, engage with the outside world. And, and uh, furthermore, they can't quite fully recruit the task positive networks uh, in, in, into the engagement with the outside world, which would account for you know, some of the decrease in concentration and apathy that we see in depressed patients. Um, OK, so <clears throat> the, um, in, I'm just going to do this one very quickly because I want to get through to the next. But uh, basically, in PTSD, the salience network seems to be hyperactive which it's responsible for detecting uh, salient internal and external stimuli and directing attention either internally or externally and sort of toggling between default mode and executive networks. And so um, its, uh, its hyperactivation could underlie some of the hypervigilance we see in, in PTSD. And the hypo connectivity and activity in the default mode network could underlie the inability to regulate and su uh, suppress the uh, memories since the default mode is involved in accessing memory. So you have the <clears throat> inability to you know, put aside these uh, disturbing memories. Um, and uh, in psychosis, um, there's a, a decrease in, in um, isolation between networks. So in a normal, healthy individual, you see that the uh, functional networks are uh, isolated from each other, but also um, have some degree of connection between them so that they can do their job, but they can also coordinate. And in psychosis, we see this consistent trend towards a uh, decrease in the uh, internal structure of each network and then also a, a bleeding of one network into the other. So it's thought that these, um, dynam change, uh, these changes could underlie some of the um, inability to distinguish between internal stimuli and external environment, and some of the delusions, hallucinations, and distortion of reality that you see in, in psychotic patients. Yeah? Uh, I understand these are schematics, these like yeah. These are What's based the on. Idea this to make images? Well, these are these are uh, data-driven images based on resting state connectivity between nodes within network the, each network. So, um, the degree of connectivity, as measured by those <laughs> correlations in bulb signal, right, are are, are different in the healthy versus psychotic patients. And this study was a uh, hundred. Of, of each, uh, both control and normal. And the psychotic patients were schizophrenics, bipolar, anyone with psychotic uh, symptoms that were active. Oh. Um, so I understand that the connection between the nodes is significant, but like how, could you talk a little bit about like the distance between the nodes? Yeah, um, so I think the idea is that uh, the, for example, here, the default mode network in a healthy individual, the distance between each node represents its uh, functional connectivity with itself, right? And then in uh, a psychotic patient, there's a disintegration within networks. And then also you can see how the, it's, it's, it's more closely connected to other networks than it was in the healthy brain. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. All right. Um, so I want to talk now about the psychedelics. The reason it's important is because we found that there are these positive clinical results uh, to treat depression and anxiety, particularly among uh, cancer patients with life-threatening diagnosis. And so these are just some of the examples. And the, 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 these durable effects that really, la after a single drug administration, they last for you know, six months and more, a reduction in symptoms of, of depression and anxiety. And uh, also the psychedelic experience is characterized by this dissolution of a sense of self. So um, what is the psychedelic experience? Well, 
Um, it, they were originally thought of as psychotomimetics because there's this overlap between psychotic symptoms and psychedelic, uh, the, the, the behavior of people under psychedelics. It's also been called hallucinogenics because you have hallucinations, entheogens because it's used in religious ceremonies, um, holotropic is another word, this sort of moving towards wholeness or dissolution of the boundaries of self. And um, the question is what, how, what accounts for their therapeutic effect in, in, the, in the patients? Uh, and one line of, uh, one postulate postulated mechanism of action is that psychedelics deactivate the default, well, we can see that they deactivate the default mode network, and I'll show you how, um, and increase global connectivity in the brain, but uh, it's, it's also, we can see that th this deactivation of the default mode network is positively correlated with the extent to which they feel a dissolution of the ego. And the therapeutic effect itself is correlated with the uh, magnitude of mystical experience that they have. So. I'm going to walk through what, what exactly I mean by that. Um, it, so what happens in the brain in, under psychedelics? Well, there's a number of things that happen. You have, uh, they were expecting, you know, from such a vivid experience under psychedelics that you would have an increase in activity overall. But in fact, they found the, there, was a, there were no increases in blood flow anywhere in the brain. And the only change they saw were decreases in blood flow in the default mode network and some subcortical structures. Um, there's also uh, decreased uh, connectivity within networks, uh, within the default mode network and within some other, uh, some of the task positive networks. And they found the, probably the most powerful correlation was this um, decrease in oscillatory power. So the, the, uh, the um, oscillatory power in the EEG readings in, in the PCC in particular, in the alpha frequency, was reduced quite a bit. So it decreases normal metabolism in the default mode network. It decreases connectivity and oscillatory power. Um, another way to visualize it is this um, change in uh, global brain connectivity. So the, um, a, a placebo patient has these nodes and networks that have normal traffic of communication between them. And then under psilocybin, uh, the default mode network goes, goes quiet, and there's a lot more diversity of crosstalk between regions that normally don't uh, talk to each other. Once again, resting state functional connectivity based data. Um, so despite there's less, less blood flow overall, there's more diversity of signals. In, in, the, in the brain under psilocybin, for example. So is the idea that we have default mode network with a lot of activity to sort of silence other connections? Because this seems to be what's going on with psilocybin, where everything is connecting with everything. Yeah. Like is, is it to increase the signal to noise by decreasing the noise? Um, yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I think. It's uh, one way of looking at it is, is that it's, um, you know, the default mode network is kind of this reducing valve that, you know, it comes on and organizes the brain activity into a stable set of patterns. And then if, if that goes quiet, then uh, much div greater diversity of, uh, of, uh, of con connectivity motifs can form. So here's just to, to show the, correlation between ego disintegration, magical thinking, and this decrease in alpha power. And then on the right, you have the uh, magnitude of mystical experience correlates very uh, tightly with the uh, therapeutic eff efficacy of, of the treatment. Um, so how, as, you point, as you just asked, how do we think about this relationship between the default mode network activation and these you know, intense vis uh, mystical experiences, as they're called? And um, one way to look at it is the, um, there's so much internal and external stimuli uh, at any given moment that the brain, one of its responsibilities is to narrow that down into a uh, subjective experience that is, contains the most adaptive um, uh, information for us to be focusing on. 
So it kind of reduces down this vast array of uh, potential um, uh, inputs into something more manageable. It's sort of merciful, really. Um, but under the psychedelic experience, it, it may be that, uh, and the default mode network may be involved in, 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 in kind of filtering down what we see. And then in the psychedelic experience, uh, it's sort of a no mercy uh, opening of the tap, and the full range of experience is kind of brought into focus. Uh, yeah, go ahead. So I understand that kind of because the brain is overactive, it might harm the brain and the body. But kind of, and the treatment, but this might be kind of if you just, if one is able to tone this down, the connections a bit, kind of for people with depression or kind of the, the uh, diseases in which kind of the brain is more quiet yeah. than kind of overactive brains like ADHD and whatnot. Kind of maybe for the folks who have depression, uh, maybe kind of a, a lower version of this with maybe natural terms like, um, I don't know, the, the opposite way, the chamomile and kind of... Yeah, so this is exactly... I think you're asking, uh, is the, the increase in, you know, um, diversity of associations happening in the brain that's associated with the psychedelics, is that uh, more therapeutic for some types of disorders versus others? Is that one of what you... And it sounds kind of good at a lower tone, kind of, the connections, and maybe it's good for people with more severe diseases like depression. Uh, yeah, let me answer that. So this is one model that has been proposed to sort of organize these states of consciousness um, along a spectrum of entropy, and there's different ways of measuring that statistically. But on the one end, you have high entropy states like psychosis, the psychedelic state, or, uh, early childhood, for example, where there's um, more diversity of connections, less uh, structure to the interactions between networks. And on the other end, you have low entropy states where there are, you know, like depression, OCD, uh, sedation, addiction, these rigid, narrow uh, states of mind. And uh, it could be that uh, in terms of therapy, it, it makes more sense to uh, treat a rigid state of mind with a high entropy treatment than vice versa. You don't find people treating schizophrenics with psychedelics these days. So, uh, does, that, does that get at your question? Yeah, another question I had was, do you guys kind of look into natural herbs, like, for example, in the reverse, like, going from high entropy to a bit lower, like, tamarind and zaffron and a few other, like, um, gin, uh, turmeric, all of these kind of quite uh, quiet the brain and the body, right, naturally. The other way, kind of, I'm sure there are like ginseng and uh, maca and whatever, but not kind of naturally would do that. Well. I mean, I, I don't know that those stimulatory and uh, anti, I mean, I think of those more as anti-inflammatory and, and stimula, uh, stimulatory properties. When we're talking about the effects of psychedelics, they're much more uh, centered on the brain. And uh, specific, so I, 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 don't, I don't know if I would group those treatments in with uh, psychedelic therapy per se. Right, not, not within that, but kind of as another component, right? Because the, the brain is part of the body, right? And kind yes. of over centuries there have been like ancient remedies. Um, so in addition to these uh, synthetic drugs, has anybody thought about kind of testing natural remedies for these? Uh, not that I'm aware of. I mean, psilocybin is a natural remedy. Um. Meditation. In meditation, yeah, is an interesting piece of this conversation that I didn't have time to, to really dig into. But So yeah, I mean, I also want to, I'll just end by saying that um, some of the other ways that people have talked about the effect of psychedelics, uh, Groff was a, is a famous researcher, and he talked about how uh, the psychedelic experience amplifies the unconscious aspects of the psyche and brings them into, uh, into our purview. So um, it, it's, uh, 
And then uh, Carhart Harris, who is responsible for this entropic brain hypothesis, talks about uh, psychedelics as a regression to primary uh, consciousness, sort of pre-rational, pre-egoic consciousness. And um, yeah. Can you say a word about the mode of action? Because I think we know quite a bit now about what's happening. You mean uh, of the psychedelics? Yeah, so they are uh, they're serotonergic drugs, the classical psychedelics, and they act at the 5-HT2A receptor, uh, which is very uh, widely distributed in the brain, but in particular in layer five of the cortex and um, also in the claustrum. There are, it's the most dense uh, place of, uh, that has the most expression of 5-HT2A receptors. And um, it's also found in the visual cortex where it's in, in, in the layer that's responsible for inferential, inferential uh, visual processing. So it could be that by privileging that aspect of visual, uh, the, the visual cortex, it could lead to some of these uh, visual inferences and hallucinations that are made, for example. Um, and then at the claustrum, it seems, uh, it, there's, one, there's a possibility that it um, facilitates the connection. By activating the claustrum, you facilitate the connection between brain regions that normally don't connect with each other. Um, the molecules are tightly binding this particular serotonin receptor. Yes, yes. And, prevent, and they just sit there and they, and that, they, that would prevent, you know, other, the serotonin that's coming from other synapses to bind there in its place, but is it mostly thought that it's just by sitting there, it's just hyperactivating the, the neurons well, that it's binding? Yeah, or? it's, uh, it, so the, um, the receptor tends to be a sub-threshold receptor. It just potentiates uh, firing. Um, and uh, so it's, it's an excitatory uh, re receptor, but it, the LSD or psilocybin don't tend to, in themselves, induce action potentials, but they just cause a, a, a greater excitability of the neuron. However, there is a small subset of neurons that are excited uh, by stimulation of the 5-HT2A receptor, and those are in the claustrum, which is why I was getting at that part of it, because it seems like if uh, they excite the claustrum and then the places where it's projecting to have been potentiated uh, by these sub-threshold changes, then it can lead to these what they call like neuronal avalanches of activity that would cause a profound change in global brain. So I guess one thing that's confusing to me is if it's increasing the potential for firing, yeah. is it binding in the regions of the DMN, which is made quieter, or is it binding in other places and it's a, it's a secondary effect that the DMN is quieter? Because it mean, seemed like it would quiet down the DMN if it was binding there. Yeah, uh, whatever's happening is way more global than, you know, oh, there's 5-HT2 receptors in the default mode network yeah. and psychedelics hit those. It's definitely more of a reorganization of the total of the whole system in such a way that the default mode network seems to go relatively quiet, especially in the alpha, yeah. All right, so we'll leave more questions to the uh, discussion, uh, and we're going to hear a lot more about the algorithms that are used to investigate this network uh, in the next talk. Let's thank the speaker one more time. Thank you so much for this introduction. I guess the mic is working. Um, so um, as um, you heard, I tried to straddle two domains. The one is the uh, Department of Psychiatry and Neuroscience, where I'm based, RWTH University in Germany. And then I also spend uh, some time every year at INRIA Sacré, which if uh, you may not know uh, yet, is something like a Max Planck Institute, a chain in France, but with a particular focus on uh, numerical optimization and machine learning. So, and we try to revisit questions in systems neuroscience and health, try to reformulate them from a machine learning perspective to um, bring new insight into the application domain. So, and I will uh, present a number of ways in which we try to approximate the biology by algorithmic tools, but it's in the mirror because there is always an epistemological gap between those two, and I will try to uh, focus on how close we can actually get to what we are trying to study. So uh, one of, just very quick, my favorite introductions is uh, 
to uh, the default mode is actually this quote from William James, very, very well-known uh, psychologist, and um, he uh, came up with this notion of the stream of consciousness, and um, I think it is perhaps an early indicator for what a lot of people today may associate to what the default mode network may be doing. So, and uh, we heard that there are these uh, parts of the brain that consume all this energy, um, but that also um, seem to be coming online among the earliest kind of regions when human beings wake up from sleep or become conscious from anesthesia. We also know that uh, these parts of the brain that are in yellow here, but that they are collections of those parts of the brain that have potentially expanded most in evolution compared to monkeys. So uh, it is a collection of the potentially most complicated parts of the brain, so the highest neural processing level in the entire central nervous system. So, and um, people then usually ask, so do animals also have that? And uh, as far as I know, uh, monkeys, cats, and rats, they do have some protoform of that default mode network, which makes it pretty complicated, makes it even more complicated to know what these specific cognitive processes may be that these potentially highest neural integration centers of the brain may be subserving. So, and uh, in health, we're also interested in the default mode network as well as in biomarker research because um, in these more than a thousand papers per year on this particular brain network, um, there is hardly any psychiatric or neurological disease that has not been shown to have some aberration in the default mode network. So and if you put this on its head, it may be a, a, a very nice biomarker perhaps in the future. So uh, one of the papers that originally got me interested in the default mode network uh, when I started research about eight years ago is this paper. And uh, just very quick, uh, what they did is a quantitative integration of literatures on reordering, reorienting, I'm sorry. Um, so stimuli indicate uh, where subjects should pay attention to. Uh, and, and this part of the default mode, the right temporal parietal junction, TPJ, I'm going to use this word again. So this is what comes up if you integrate across dozens of studies where people are supposed to reorient their attention, so which is a lower level type of process. Um, uh, agency type of um, kind of studies also show this location as well as higher social cognition, which we briefly mentioned, but also empathy, more higher emotional processes. So, and the problem is now, why do uh, four pretty separate types of literatures uh, that are not a priori really connected to each other, why do they all show convergence of neural activity increase in this part of the brain? So, and this begs the question, is this a same functional compartment or are there perhaps several separate underlying units inside of this part of the right default mode network or not, right? So, and here's one way um, how you can get at that question. Um, it departs from um, three exemplary literatures, one on attention, one on sensory motor integration, and one on higher social cognition as theory of mind, which is perhaps hard to read here. So, and uh, you use methods um, just to define where you really want to perform a deep search for subregions. And um, this can be done by just merging where these separate literatures that don't really talk to each other that much, where they all together think where this particular functional module in the brain may be, okay? So this, is, this first step is really just about defining your um, kind of starting point for the analysis. So once you have that, you use the following kind of raw biological fact. Um, we know from axonal tracing studies, invasive research in animals for decades, that every single um, microstructurally distinct part of the brain has a unique set of input and output connections to the rest of the brain, okay? So this is one of the anatomic effects that we have high confidence in. So, and we can use that fact in non-invasive imaging in humans to ask um, the various little voxels inside of my region of interest, may they be different in terms of how they are connected to the rest of the brain, okay? So the input features are functional connectivity strengths 
to the rest of the brain, to the rest of the gray matter. And um, we want to know, uh, are there perhaps subregions inside of this uh, part of the right default one network? Because we want to know whether different subregions may subserve different classes of cognitive processes that are all associated with this major brain network. So essentially, uh, this is um, uh, an important and immediate output, a spectral reordering, where you can see that in two different types of function connecti connectivity, this is the one that we heard uh, a lot about in the previous talk. There's another one that is more task-based. I'm not going to go into detail. But the point is, uh, it, with an agreement of more than 90%, you can come up with two clusters um, that um, present coherent function connectivity to the rest of the brain, a more anterior one and a more posterior one. So, and if you um, kind of bring this to a connectivity network analysis, you can then show that they have opposite relationships to two uh, major brain networks that we mentioned before, the more saliency network, so anterior insula and uh, mid cingulate cortex. So this one is positively covered with the anterior but negative with the posterior, whereas the parts of the default mode network, they have this exact opposite relationship to these subregions that people believe to be the same thing. And uh, because it is positively covered with the more posterior part, and uh, Positive, uh, negatively covered with the anterior one, okay? So um, in a part of the default one network that has been associated with both lower level types of cognitive processes, but also higher level, more complicated types of thinking, such as uh, moral cognition, uh, theory of mind, and so on, we can come up with two subregions, and they have almost um, kind of antagonistic relationships to the other um, canonical brain networks. So we have been doing this for uh, all major nodes of the default mode network over the last uh, couple of years. So there is uh, separate projects and papers for each of these major nodes of the default mode network. And that is uh, important because um, these potentially highest integrative parts of the brain, we don't know why, but they seem to disrespect uh, mm, classical anatomical maps. Okay, so for example, uh, the TPJ is exactly in between the temporal lobe and the parietal lobe, but these should be doing very different things. Okay, and analogous uh, statements could be made about all these other major brain uh, nodes. So, and this is why if uh, you don't have a precise definition of where these subregions are really located uh, in the human brain, uh, we uh, argue then you will uh, potentially mix up things that should be treated separate. Okay, so you will see that in the, in the studies that I talk about, uh, oftentimes we'll make use of this data-driven definition of a functional atlas of the human default mode network at the subregion level. So uh, here's kind of a very uh, heuristic first example of how people in imaging neuroscience try to use uh, machine learning algorithms to make statements about um, how these parts of the brain are different. So uh, typically, as a data analysis machine or in person, you may think uh, you want to study the entire gray matter, let's say, in a single shot analysis. So what do I mean? If you uh, just uh, vectorize all the um, volume measures in this case, so how much volume is in each part of the gray matter, you end up with 100,000 or 200,000 uh, variables. Okay. So but the problem is, and um, that is a lot of features at the same time. Uh, you get a lot of problems that revolve around the curse of dimensionality. Examples are pretty far away in high dimensions. It's really hard to compare uh, all these things that you probably heard about in previous seminars. So the question is, how can you fit a single model um, based on so many different input features and still make statements about where the signal comes from? So uh, one uh, approach that emerged uh, more than 10 years ago that is very popular now is so-called searchlight analysis. So the, this frequentist ad hoc kind of in-between classic sets machine learning type of procedure works the following way. Um, it uh, looks at a little part of the brain at a time and it only picks the few dozen gray matter volume uh, values for this location, all the brain scans that you have. Okay, so it, it uh, in one step, it ignores most of the information in the brain, 
and it only considers the one that is in, in a radius of, let's say, five millimeters or 10 millimeters, and goes through a whole cross-validation cycle that has uh, model fitting on some usually larger training data using an already fitted model on the usually smaller test data part, and you get a certain out-of-sample prediction accuracy, right? Um, which in this case, uh, you will see is about distinguishing people uh, diagnosed with depression or healthy people. So, and this will give you one uh, cross validation estimate of the expected out-of-sample performance that is then mapped to the center of that searchlight, okay? So you did one whole cross validation with one kind of out-of-sample accuracy that is mapped to one voxel. So then this entire procedure is repeated as many times as you have granular voxels, okay? So you move on, you go to the right by one voxel and you repeat the whole procedure. So what this gives you is a whole, a, a whole brain map with accuracies that are indicators for how well you can distinguish healthy people and people uh, diagnosed with depression only in a particular part of the brain, okay? So, and by this kind of brute force way to uh, reduce the information to locations, you can kind of um, sidestep this typical problem of machine learning algorithms to kind of make precise statements about which parameters are actually most important in achieving a certain prediction. So, there were several questions. Yeah. Um, so the left side feels like a GWAS where you just use all of the variants at once to predict the phenotype and you have way too many features. The right side feels like a fancier version of just testing each variant one at a time. Uh, yeah, yeah, in a way, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but not quite that. Like, so I, on the right side, the simpler thing would be just like for each voxel, just do case control. Do a, do, do a, a statistical test, any, anything. Um, um, why are they doing this more complicated procedure? Yeah, okay, good, good point. So, um, of course, you could also just look at every single voxel at a time and ask, is this different, uh, so as a marginal kind of analysis, is that different between the groups or not? So, uh, good point. So, what I forgot to mention is uh, the people really wanted to be multivariate in the sense that you want to know whether there are relationships in the local neighborhood of the volume differences that may be um, kind of coherent enough to allow for a prediction rule to tell apart the two groups, okay? So it looks for multivariate patterns in a local fashion, which gets around the curse of dimensionality, but is also kind of um, more um, kind of advanced than a local marginal voxel level test, because it makes statements about the local neighborhoods in an iterative fashion. Other questions? Yeah. Um, so the approach on the right kind of reminds me uh, about the structured learning of proteins. Okay. Now, over here, I think the elements would be the neurons or what, the, the different components of the brain that connect. And the protein thing is the amino acids. Uh, over here are the connections <coughs> between the elements of the brain. Over there are the interactions between the... We really only have volumes. There's really no interaction in this type of data. No, okay, but there's the reality and then there's abstraction, right? You're abstracting it in, in boxes, right? Mm, yeah, as a course, a summary correlate of a volume density in a certain location. So over there also, kind of, because they can't deal with so many amino acids in the protein, they abstract that into boxes as well. And now how big the box it is, kind of, can, Obviously, the bigger it is, the faster the algorithm would run, mm -hmm. but the less accuracy it would result in. Um, I can't remember the name of the algorithm, but kind of it reminds me a lot of that. And there's a lot of like, between fields. There's a lot of kind of interplay uh, in the methodology. And basically, what they do is kind of for each, I mean, as for each box, they kind of compute the energies that are associated with that. And then they find a uh, a global minimum mm -hmm. after iterating through that number of times. Okay, so you're pointing out there's a lot of similarities with certain protein analyses. Yeah. Yeah. So so I'm yeah. starting in genetics, but I guess uh, the difference is kind of like related to GWAS versus constraining the search space to a bunch of 
kind of target locations, let's say the 100-ish schizophrenia risk locations, and then performing a more elaborate uh, analysis in a predefined space as a form of um, domain-informed feature selection. That is really what this is doing in the topographical space. So you know that all the features that you have there from that location, and in that sense, you get kind of a topographically defined response that the brute force whole brain machine learning analysis would not be able to give you. So, and then kind of the other thing is that if they have it for the head D model, and then they have it for a disease model, and then they can compare the topographies and whatnot between the two things and then extract the main players. So, so the prediction rule is not really, so the, how exactly these voxels are used, so the actual model parameters in this particular approach are not that important. Does this make sense to everybody? Right, the difference between the two models is more, if you have the healthy one, and then you have any kind of diseases. Yeah, so typically that's, the, that's just one difference. So oftentimes, uh, you use linear support vector machines to do this. You could use something more complicated. Typically, it doesn't really give you an advantage. Um, and um, you could also use correlation. But uh, the linear classifiers, they just have one set of model parameters, okay? So if you have 100 voxels in here, it will give you 100 beaters with like uh, non-zero values, positive, negative. And this distinguishes healthy from kind of MDD patients. So they're not two models, it's like one model. Okay, there's another question? How do you deal with the smoothness of the images uh, at start? Because it's a kind of confounding factor for your measurements of... You mean in Gaussian, Gaussian filter? Yeah, yeah. yeah, so that is kind of a, a debate that hasn't really converged yet. Um, so there's kind of a trade-off between optimizing signal to noise, but then also kind of like homogenizing microstructural differences between people. So there's kind of a valley somewhere in between where uh, kind of like it helps to do some Gaussian filtering, okay? So this is roughly the very empirical situation, okay? All right, but let's keep going. So um, this is really just to say that in a particular disease such as major depression, you can go into a particular part of the default mode, which was here the frontal pole. And it's important to know that for almost 100 years, the frontal pole, which is Broadman area 10, was assumed to be a same brain region, okay? Same cytoarchitecture, same kind of, looks the same under the microscope, so people thought it should do something that is the same. It sub should subserve the same class of neural processes. So, but uh, in a paper uh, just a few years ago, people showed that um, there's probably a more medial compartment and the more lateral compartment inside of the frontal uh, nodes of the default mode. So the important thing is now, if you run search and analysis only in the frontal pole to distinguish local structural patterns between healthy people and those people diagnosed with a major depression, then you find differences so the highest accuracies that distinguish these two groups in uh, the medial parts of the brain, okay? So until recently we thought this red and blue parts, BA10, the frontal node of the default mode, should be homogeneous, microstructurally homogeneous regions. So uh, we confirm, however, in a data-driven fashion that also in a pathophysiological condition, um, the diagnosis of major depression, we can find multivariate predictive patterns that distinguish those two groups only by the local uh, structural um, changes. And those kind of um, localize especially to the medial compartment, okay? So and this kind of confirms that this recent kind of discovery of microstructural differences actually uh, in the media and the more lateral parts of the frontal lobe, that those may be relevant to disease, okay? So this is just the very first example of how you could kind of alter how machine learning is used in a more domain kind of uh, constrained fashion to uh, find out differences in, in, in disease too. Okay, so three very quick primers uh, that try to build on what we heard in the previous talk. So I like this paper from Doria and colleagues because it showed that um, the set of canonical brain networks, including the default mode network, 
they probably emerge before birth. Okay, so they really try to uh, distinguish what comes first, cognition or the canonical brain networks that we heard about in the previous talk. So an important insight uh, from this paper is the default mode network is present, but it is not complete at birth in humans probably, uh, especially because um, the TPJs on the left and right uh, that, that I talked about before, they, were, they are not present yet, okay? So um, another important kind of intermediate insight to kind of understand the upcoming slides is that paper uh, that showed and that we that that made us believe um, that um, these canonical brain networks they are present in resting state function connectivity and in task constrained types of connectivity. So the point is. Um, the default mode network is kind of difficult to study from this experimental, like experimentally focused perspective where you think that um, a defined set of contextual stimulation and tasks um, modulates and, and exhaustively controls to some extent certain parts of the brain, right? So um, the default mode saliency network, dorsal attention network, and all these, they are present no matter what people do. Okay, and this makes it very difficult to just use experimental task paradigms to really understand what this major brain network is doing. And as we heard before, a key aspect of this is it typically deactivates during these experimental conditions, so it kind of evades the experimental control very carefully. So here's another kind of key fact, and that is uh, just very briefly, if you ask when do functional connectivity between pairs of nodes kind of um, have the same strengths in a later scan in another individual or later in time, then what we find is um, that nodes of a same brain network, they typically have a replicable connectivity strength. But if you, if you compare two nodes in functional connectivity at different times, and you find that if those nodes are not part of the same canonical network, then they're also much more volatile, okay? So, and this made us ask, is the, um, the relationships between these major brain networks in the recruitment, in the relative recruitment, isn't that perhaps an underappreciated unit of functional brain organization? So here's kind of another approach how you can uh, use um, classic machine learning methods to get at that particular question. So we used the, at the time, biggest data set, uh, which had um, task and resting state data from 500 people to, in the first step, just extract a network candidates as a type of a dictionary. So, and I can already uh, foreshadow, it doesn't really matter whether you use principal component analysis, independent component analysis, some other factor analysis, autoencoders. The point is really that you want spatio-temporally coherent templates that are effective expressions of the high dimensional uh, changes that go on in these fMRI measurements in general, okay? So, we just picked 40. We then uh, projected these more than 100,000 variables onto uh, 40 um, kind of network loadings as a correlate or as a proxy of the extent to which a certain spatial temporal pattern or brain network is recruited or not recruited uh, at a certain uh, point in time. So in these kind of network recruitment indicators, we're then used to um, learn a classifier that distinguishes 18 different tasks. So the tasks are not so important, yeah? We just used a battery of things that uh, go from motor execution to sensory perception to uh, higher social cognition. So basic processes, advanced processes, sensory, motor, everything. So you can show that you can learn a, a certain combination of these canonical brain networks that are indicative of the presence of a certain cognitive task, okay? So if you only get the brain scan of a single person, you can re-express it as 40 numbers only and use those to tell this particular mental activity apart from the 17 other mental activities. So here's one, one concrete example. 
I get you. I, I get you that. I know the question always comes up, yeah. Did you do any filtering on those 40 components in the sense that you chose them in a way that are shared for all the samples? Or the what do you mean by shared? So what if you know, some of those components are very, very individual specific? It's just they're really due to PCA or something like that. And if you know, one of your samples has a lot of variation, you can devour one of your principal components. Um, those are important questions. Uh, the way the community deals with this is typically that you subsample resting state uh, images from the various people uh, and then just perform kind of a group level uh, but not necessarily hierarchical matrix factorization. And that is how people come up with kind of a group average latent space for everybody. So very pragmatic. All right, so um, a lot of people are interested in trustworthiness judgments because they think it is a more advanced um, type of processing of the kind of social effect of properties of another individual. And a favorite control condition is gender judgments. So um, because it is believed not to recruit social or emotional types of thinking. So uh, the thing is, what these people see that do these types of tasks in the scanner is exactly the same. So the point is, what people see in the scanner is exactly the same. Um, they only differ in what we call the top-down modulation of these neural processes, right? So, and this is also why we get pretty similar whole brain neural activity maps that are related uh, to these types of tasks in 500 people. But the question is, how are they different? So, and these are seven of the over 40 uh, spatial temporal network uh, compartments that we extracted in the, in the first step. And what you see here is that three of them are actually recruited in both of these um, tasks. That's visual input processing, limbic emotions, uh, and social processing, and sensory motor output processing. But the interesting part is here in black, the default mode network, we can see that this overall usually mixed up pattern of neural activity components can be um, kind of separated out to show that it is really the default mode network as a set of distributed brain regions that is uh, distinctly relatively deactivated in the control condition and activated in the social effective task. Okay, so this is how you can show that if you come up with a, a network definition first and then you use that to re-express the high dimensional information uh, along the effective dimensions that we really have in the fMRI data, you can show that this network, although it overlaps with many other networks, you can show that that network is uh, probably a huge part of the explanation of why the overall brain neural activity patterns are distinct, okay? All right, now we get back to uh, your question. Um, so uh, typically people want to know how many components exist in the in a functional brain architecture, right? What's the eigenmodes, the number of eigenmodes in the brain? So we have not definitively answered this question and we can only answer it as uh, to the extent that we can measure these phenomena with fMRI technology, right? But the answer is probably somewhere between like 20 and five, let's say, ish. So we tried to kind of answer this question the following way. Uh, this is the data set I showed you before with the 18 tasks. So there's another one uh, that also has 18 tasks. And there are two different ways to come up with this network definition. Sparse PCA, I'm gonna get into sparsity soon. And independent component analysis that I'm sure many of you know. So and the thing is now uh, that we uh, repeat this 18 task classification task, okay? Uh, 18 kind of experimental conditions should be distinguished. And uh, this is the accuracy that you get when a brain scan comes in and based on the network recruitments, you're supposed to tell how, how sure am I that it's this particular test rather than the 17 other ones. So when you see that um, you really only get a big drop when you have only access to five, less than 10, like five or one uh, network recruitments rather than 10, 20, and 40, okay? So a very coarse answer to your question is in this particular setting that if you use these two types of matrix decompositions, we found similar things for other uh, matrix factorizations, that if you go below 10 um, kind of dimensions of variation that underlie the whole brain neural activity signal, 
only then you get a larger drop in the classification accuracy. How much does that depend on the AT? Uh, we didn't look into this. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm misreading these plots, but uh, if there are so many tasks, how can you be so accurate with only one independent component? Um, you can imagine that, you know, uh, yeah. Each independent component should correspond to a task, maybe. And so with one independent component, you should predict something like one out of the number of tasks you're looking at correctly. Um, well, that's a, so the, the way I like to read this is um, the effective dimensionality of these 100 to 200,000 gray matter voxels is probably pretty low. So that's one aspect. You, you can learn a lot about how all these tasks are different by even projecting them onto one component. Yes. So another kind of footnote on that is uh, these tasks were really designed to be as different as possible. So they tap onto very different systems in the brain. So they were designed to be very dif different, which is why you would expect that even if, you're, if you have a few components, you can distinguish them pretty well which doesn't mean that you capture the full picture of that task in the, in the data. I would say the more different the tasks are, the higher the latent dimensionality should be. Well, the easier it is to distinguish them with one component. How do you define the prediction accuracy actually? The, the accuracy? Well, this is the out of sample cross validated uh, accuracy, and we used a one versus rest classification scheme. So, and, uh, one divided by 18 is the baseline chance to get one task right. So, so that one principal component, or like one, one infant component, could it be that it's just, it, it's taskness or something like that? It's just that it's, a, it's, it's very puzzling, again, for me too, that you know how you can have an accuracy of 80% with just one number. Well, because the effect, so, so the core intuition that's going to be important for the next slide is really maybe we don't need the the information from every voxel, okay? That is, for me, the core message from this. So, but I'm gonna get back to aspects. 80% with one variable on 18 different tasks. Well, because you learned, uh, you learned components from the same data. So you know the structure from the data. Yeah, I mean, but do they actually think it's I mean, you can just plot that, right? You just show yeah, one dimension. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We're gonna get back to, we're gonna get back to aspects of this. So uh, just the core intuition from this particular slide, uh, it's kind of pretty complicated, but the, the core thing was, can you use the networks that you extract from REST to make accurate classifications between the tasks, okay? So what you see here is, um, how is, how is your classification accuracy for 18 different tasks? How is it different if, you learn the networks from the same set of tasks. So it, it should be closely aligned with the, with the types of uh, fluctuation that this task battery induces in the brain. If you learn it from, the, from this other task battery, or uh, if you learn networks from resting state data, so when no task happened, or noise as a negative test. Okay, so the core conclusion across all this is that we, we didn't find a statistically significant difference in the classification performance, whether or not we extracted the atomic networks from uh, experiments or from mind-wandering random thought resting state data, okay? So, and this is an indirect way to kind of provide evidence that the canonical brain networks may be pretty similar during an active, like, focused human being and kind of a, a mind-wandering human being. But it's, there's a lot of details to this. But this is just the core statement. All right, so we try to, uh, and this is kind of getting more into kind of the modeling parts now, we try to go one step more towards kind of learning these networks from data. So what we did in this previous project is a two-step approach where we have an unsupervised uh, dimensionality reduction step based on the intuition that few overall patterns of variation across the whole cortical mantle should really matter to distinguish 18 tasks that are pretty different to begin with. But 
we uh, identified these networks in a way that is um, disregarding what types of tasks we are going to distinguish with them. So what we did here is we melted uh, autoencoders and uh, a factor, factored version of logistic regression into each other. So the autoencoder um, is this very interesting generalization of many of the uh, matrix factorizations that we know and love, such as principal component analysis. You can show that you recover ICA types of subspaces and also sparse BCA types of subspaces. So a single architecture is pretty flexible in coming up with latent representations and high dimensional data in general, which is why it's a favorite toy in like the machine and deep learning communities. So what we did is we um, kind of um, coupled how we go from single voxels uh, across the gray matter to these latent network-ish representations with a low rank logistic regression that shares the weights of how you get from individual voxels to uh, mutually overlapping network representations. And only this part of this overall model that's supervised task classification. So the point is that you have what you call a, a, a prediction task, uh, but you have the subtask of also performing a, an unsupervised um, structure discovery step where you do not kind of look for latent representations that have um, a small reconstruction loss, but those that optimally help you to distinguish 18 different tasks, okay? So this is how you learn those types of network representations from fMRI and test data that help you best to make kind of uh, discrimination easy in where a particular brain scan comes from, okay? So, and you combine kind of asking what are these networks and how can I distinguish tasks into which network should I actually have assumed to distinguish the tasks, okay? So you can show that um, if you do these consecutive two steps of separate structure discoveries, PCA, sparse PCA, ICA, autoencoders, you go as low as 32% accuracy in the same 18 tasks with five uh, components, but we tried also up to 100. Whereas if you solve the combined problem of structure discovery and out of sample prediction, then you never go lower than 95% accuracy. So, and this is how you get a better model performance if you combine two tasks and you use a more complicated model with more parameters, but you, you get an edge uh, in uh, out of sample prediction. Yes? Okay, uh, you could have just trained a deep neural network that didn't care all about preserving information. Mm -hmm. And how would that have compared to we, we did try that, of course. Uh, so um, what happens is um, we try to extend this, these architectures uh, by uh, deep layers and non-linearity. So, and in these type of data for this prediction task, we did not get uh, performance gains. Yeah, you don't have much room left. <laughs> Sorry? You don't have much room left. The, the 90 notes are pretty, go back to the number. Uh, yeah. That's pretty so, so, so yeah, we try to deepify this approach. There's gonna be deep, on the next slides, um, but for this particular test, we didn't see uh, gains. So getting back to vanilla logistic regression. So for five of these 18 tasks, you see the ground truth neural activity image, so the group average of where people uh, usually activate or deactivate during tongue movement, for example, okay? So this is what the images should look like. This is what uh, vanilla logistic regression, this time trained on the whole brain. This is what we previously said is probably not that smart because of the curse of dimensionality. So when you see that it does uh, recover aspects of the um, neural activity changes that we try to get at, but if you, if you learn this more complicated model that actually internally operates on the latent representations, you get much closer to what you're actually trying to do. So the support recovery is much better if you, if you learn this more complicated model. All right, so and important uh, kind of uh, transition to the next slides is we, we have two parts with two potentially separate inputs. So here we now fed in only resting state data from mind wandering individuals that do not do anything in particular. And the question is of course, can we improve the prediction of the task 
if we learn from more resting state data what the networks actually look like. Okay, so a semi-supervised prediction task this time. So here are some first indicators that this may work and is promising in, in fMRI data. So here you see the ratio of task maps to rest maps. And you see that if you don't have that many images, which is the normal case in fMRI research, then if you have more unlabeled brain scans, we do actually see increases in the prediction performance, okay? So of up to 10%. So these are just some indicators that if you use unlabeled data that is less costly and easy to find, you may improve your prediction performance of um, the smaller experimental data set that you have because you can learn properties of the general neural activity changes and leverage those to improve the predictions. Um, so, yes? So that when you have like, a, when you say our oh, sample performance, uh, so you're not even using the rest maps of that individual for training the output, right? Um, so during, good question. So um, we only use uh, the resting state data during the training phase because we simultaneously learn the parameters of the autoencoder and the logistic regression with a lowering structure. But um, if, if you only have um, a labeled task images, image, a test phase, you can leave out uh, the autoencoder part. Is that the question? Uh, I guess my question is that, so I just wanna know whether you're, you're making a universal claim here or whether you're still you know, could be like tapping into individual features. Like, a good out of sample test for me would be to completely set apart everything that I know from an individual, including its rest path and its task map, mm -hmm. and train everything that I have, like a service provider, out of quarter, and mm -hmm. a bunch of other people, and then feed that person's data into here. And then... So, kind of the, the, the cross validation scheme is really kind of the, the most commonplace cross validation scheme. There's like nothing fancy. So, um, in each of the test sets, which is, I think, 10% uh, of the data, you really use um, brain scans from people that the model has never seen before, which can be task scans and rest scans. So there's really nothing particular or fancy on the cross validation level. Okay, so we then try to deepify this intuition that we may be able to do transfer learning, right? So the indicators from the previous slide were that we may be perhaps able to extract some neural activity cognition components in fMRI data in certain task batteries that may be useful in making statements about another task battery, okay? So uh, the question is, essentially, on the biological level, is there a set of atomic parts that define kind of the brain behavior relationships as we can measure them with fMRI? So does this question make sense? Now, are there kind of atomic modules in the mind that we can measure with fMRI? If those exist, it should be possible to show transfer learning effects um, in distinguishing tasks from data sets that we haven't seen yet, okay? So this is what you're trying to do here. This is now the DP-fied autoencoder uh, that uh, somebody asked. Um, we again perform a um, projection onto latent spaces of different dimensionalities in this first layers but uh, then um, kind of have nonlinear um, layers as well, where you can learn uh, more complicated uh, hierarchical relationships between how network recruitments are really related to each other to solve a multi-class um, prediction problem where again, we have uh, indicators from, and brain scans from various different tasks that people do perform in the scanner. So but the core question really is, can we use that to distinguish tasks with the latent components that we found in other sets of experiments. So in that kind of core kind of conclusion is here. Um, if you have no transfer, so you do not use knowledge of cognitive atomic components from a different part of the data, then this is how well you do with data from always more subjects, the red line. Whereas if you use the kind of candidate modules of neural activity in the mind, uh, 
then uh, you can perform uh, much better, but this increase is mostly seen if you really don't have a lot of information, okay? So if, if you're in a low sample regime, then you can get an edge on their classification performance by using those um, data-driven network behavior components that you extracted in a completely different type of data set, okay? All right, um, let's keep going. Um, well, this is just to say these latent components, you can map them to the brain and we can associate them with ways that are established in the community to uh, labels of tasks and behaviors that are established already in the community. So these latent components that we extract, we can uh, um, kind of extract them from the model and um, relate them to other uh, cognitive notions that people uh, have been thinking in and about uh, over years. Okay. Do you have intuition as to why the individual factors, coordinates here are meaningful as opposed to getting, learning some other linear transformation of them that wouldn't be? Um, okay, so are you getting at the, the rotation problem yeah. of PCA compared to ICA? Uh, is this ICA based or? Uh, no, no, it's, it's this model. So, yeah. uh, we're, we're not in kind of linear algebra uh, fundamental. It's really kind of way off. So, um, these questions of identifiability and you need... Okay, but you have sparsity in force in this first stage. Um, the regularization scheme here was mostly dropout. I see. All right, let's, let's, let's talk about it in this session. Yeah. Yeah. I have more regularization stuff here. Great. So, uh, you should be confused at this point of the talk because um, in the beginning, I hope you're confused, because in the beginning I, I, I said What's really important is these nodes of the default mode network, and they have subregions that are disjoint, and that corresponds to this classic notion of functional segregation in the brain. So there are distinct disjoint territories, and they look different under the microscope, and they should be subserving different classes of neural processing. So this is kind of the, the classical notion. But over recent years, there's always more momentum in kind of an opposite um, ideology, and that is what really subserve higher kind of cognitive processing, maybe the complicated integration of all these functionally specialized regions, right? So, um, but if you really think about it philosophically, it's actually inextricable. So uh, on the one extreme, you need to integrate in a dynamic fashion, but what are you actually integrating? Well, these functionally specialized types of regions, how do they talk to the rest by function connectivity? So it doesn't really make sense to study functional segregation and function integration in separate types of literatures with separate methods. So I think we should really kind of try to integrate these, I hope you see the biology algorithm parallel here. How can we really bring together the fact that there are probably different compartments in the brain and in these type of data, but we usually study them separately, okay? So technically speaking, the problem is really there are, there are different low dimensional spaces in these high dimensional data. That is kind of the claim, okay? So there is a, a clustering type of one where there are disjoint regions which in anatomy, we are pretty sure exist in uh, kind of uh, biology and also in the MRI data that we have. But then we also have these mutually overlapping network integration types of phenomena that are also there. So um, I find this interesting from a machine learning perspective because it is, um, it is an argument to say, if we find the right bias, in close sense to um, how we train our model parameters, then we may kind of get an advantage in the usual trade-off between uh, variance and bias, right? So typically, you can have either linear models that uh, are kind of uh, not fluctuating too much in different settings, but they do not uh, approximate your phenomenon very well, or you can have, uh, well, edit at its extreme deep nets, for example, that have a lot of model variants, but uh, they can approximate the phenomenon very well. So this is the bias-variance trade-off. If, however, the bias that you impose on your model estimation 
is coherent with the biological phenomenon under study, and we think there are regions and there are networks. So if this is true, if we integrate this into our model estimation, it should be possible to uh, learn better models, although the models are more biased. Okay, so this is one of my favorite figures that illustrates this idea from uh, Hasty's Elements of Statistical Learning. So the red is our model space. So those are all the combinations of model parameters that we could get as a model solution, right? In an unconstrained fashion, so not regularized. So no L1 norm, L2 norm, or dropout, or anything like that. So uh, the blue is the space of realizations that are possible in nature. So um, here is the truth, so the relationship of brains and networks that we don't have access to. We only have particular measurements of those in a particular sample that um, we hope is representative of the truth. But the point is now, if we restrict our space of models, and that is kind of a, a central paradigm in the machine learning analytics, is to impose certain forms of bias and regularization, we actually restrict our space and we are usually learning solutions that are further away from the truth and further away from the particular sample that we approximate, hoping that we learn something about the population. But if that bias is coherent with, with biology, then we should kind of gain rather than oversimplify. So I hope this intuition makes sense. So, and the way we did that is we again kind of revised the the idea of a low rank logistic regression where we put in information from the entire gray matter. So again, 100,000-ish voxels um, at the same time as input variables to one linear model. The difference this time is that we really learn a separate model parameter for each of these locations of gray matter at the same time. But we um, inject so-called structured sparsity or a hierarchical tree penalization that is able to um, represent the prior information that each voxel is um, co-localized with other voxels uh, that are probably part of the same disjoint territory of the brain. And these territories, such as here, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex of the brain, they are linked to other kind of coherent disjoint regions that are somewhere else in the brain, but that together make up a canonical brain network, okay? So in this prior, a form of regularization, in a more structured way, we kind of intentionally bias our model and as we search the model parameters for more than 100,000 locations in the brain by saying, please try to uh, learn as many exactly zero beaters as possible. That's, that's the, the, the sparsity, a one penalized sparsity. But we know that if a voxel, and that part of, of uh, the brain is likely to be not important, it will encourage to also set all these other voxels to zero because you know it's part of the same uh, disjoint brain region probably. And if it sets that whole brain region to zero, it will encourage the, the entire network to also be set to zero, okay? So both notions, uh, functional segregation and functional integration are kind of baked into a, a biologically informed um, penalization scheme that we add to a high dimensional logistic uh, problem. This is just to uh, show you some of these priors, what they look like. So uh, for example, uh, here, you have a network representation of what the auditory cortex uh, component typically looks like in fMRI data. And we also have a, a region atlas um, that we kind of um, bring, uh, that we align with the network representation, okay? So there are voxels in each of these regions but the set of regions, they add up to this overall network. So this is how uh, you can um, learn much better models with less data. So what you see here is, again, the support recovery. So this is the, this is the weights of these logistic regression models. So on the top, you have vanilla logistic regression applied to all these 100,000 uh, voxels in uh, hundreds of subjects. And again, you try to distinguish uh, a battery of tasks just as, as a random target. So we try to approximate this overall representation. And you see that the correlation of the parameters that you get 
with a fifth of the data, two fifths of the data, and the whole data, it's pretty far away from what you're actually trying to estimate. Okay, so the support recovery is pretty bad. Um, and we can show that by introducing external established biological knowledge of at the same time region compartments and network compartments that are overlapping, um, we can learn model parameters that are as similar to what we are trying to estimate with a fifth of the data as what we get with the vanilla logistic regression. Also, if you have more data, you can get closer to the model parameters that you're actually trying to estimate if you have this intentional bias um, that we can kind of build based on hierarchical tree sparsity and established knowledge in uh, the systems neuroscience literature. So this is just the area under the curve. Red is our hierarchical tree sparsity approach. That's the only kind of neurobiologically aware type of approach. And we show that uh, along these 18 tasks that I mentioned before, you can outperform all the other L1 penalized types of approaches that were invented over the last 15 years that also impose a type of bias and structured bias, but that is unaware of these region and network compartments that we expect to be present in the data. Okay, any questions about hierarchical tree sparsity? Yes? How does the, the outcome would change if you completely shuffle the hierarchy, for instance? Oh, so, so you're asking, does it, how do you really know it really gives you an edge? Uh, good question. So um, some of the validations um, that we did uh, go in this direction. So we tried to only leave out the network prior component or only leave out the region component, and it always performed less well in prediction. Um, and we, what we also did is um, we uh, just had random assignments of the voxels to these region and network compartments, and that also performs less well. Okay. So uh, how much more do you think you have? Um, well, perhaps five other minutes? Yeah, so if anyone needs to leave, just leave quietly. We've got five more minutes, and then we'll go to the discussion. Okay, perfect. So um, this is kind of the sparsity approach to kind of um, constrain high dimensional spaces that is different from the uh, dimensionality reduction flavor that we had in the first slides. So um, kind of uh, as the final um, project, why don't we talk about... Um, our most recent project, and that is on uh, canonical correlation analysis. So um, we again try to kind of build a bridge between this idea of having a, a segregated brain in disjoint territories that's going to be on the left, and we will use the default mode subregion atlas to do this. And this other intuition and stream of research uh, that this community is pursuing, which is closer to the idea of functional integration as measured by functional coupling with fMRI signals between um, ICA type spatial temporally coherent components of the uh, signal. So um, on the one side, we measure just the just imagine the bare Pearson correlation as a measure of functional connectivity between the subregions of the default mode network. So this is inside of a network. So in here, you have between network functional connectivity because you have data on how much does each network couple overall with another network. So, and to kind of, again, bridge this functional segregation intuition and the function integration at the same time uh, to bridge those directly we used a canonical correlation analysis on both these spaces to ask um, how do uh, subregions inside of the default mode talk to each other and how does this explain how major brain networks talk to each other so and the interesting discovery is that we didn't find kind of a salt and pepper like pattern where all subregions are kind of implicated or kind of not so implicated, we really find again the right TPJ that I showed you right in the beginning together with it, and it extends this previous evidence from the first slide uh, to the left TPJ, 
So these kind of homo homologous uh, regions uh, in the default mode network, when they increase functional coupling to pretty much any other part of the default mode network inside of that major brain network, then this explains most, this is the most explanatory uh, mode of population variation in 10,000 people in the UK biobank. Then you explain most variation in the differences between the major networks, okay? So, and one hypothesis, why that is the case, maybe that, um, and this is what we already sus uh, suspected in 2013, that the right TBJs, which are not part of the default mode when a human is born, remember these first slides, that are integrated in the default mode network later, um, these ones may have something like a mediator or switching role that uh, perhaps controls the recruitment of these major brain networks to um, kind of solve challenges in the environment, okay? So this is another kind of way how you can shape your feature space in a particular way based on substantive knowledge that is already uh, present in the literature and uh, use a modeling scheme. This is really vanilla canonical correlation analysis, but to use it in a way that is coherent with our biological intuitions to come up with kind of a, a, a more thorough um, set of um, results that particular parts of the default mode network may actually be implicated in driving network reconfiguration in the human brain. Okay, so any questions about this last data slide before we go into the discussion? So if not, I would just um, conclude. I think the default mode network is still a pretty nebulous, ill-defined concept. So uh, that is a problem on the psychological level and the anatomical level. I pointed to all these kind of issues in saying where the default mode network is in the brain. Um, I think we also have a lot of uh, problems in carefully delineating what the physiological role of the default mode network may be. It's eating all this energy and it's somehow characteristic of the central nervous system of humans compared to other individuals, and it subserves uh, some of these most complicated cognitive processes that humans have, including language, social cognition, moral cognition, and so on. But what may be the unifying uh, role, and this will probably tell us something about the nature of the human species in general. Um, a core philosophical and epistemological issue uh, that I see is also that um, we humans may not perhaps have evolved the types of terms and semantics that correspond to uh, the neural processes that the default mode network is subserving, right? So they may just be so complicated that we uh, just don't have words to describe them. And the last one is, uh, and this is what I try to focus on uh, in, in my talk, is um, it is hard to make progress in understanding the default mode based on the experimental hypothesis driven and very kind of um, a priori defined types of uh, fMRI research that we had been doing over the last decades. And I'm personally convinced that uh, using population data sets and machine learning alg algorithms will give us kind of additional insight in what this major brain network may be doing. And if you look at all these issues, um, I think that we really need an intensely interdisciplinary effort to really make progress in understanding this very complicated uh, phenomenon in the human brain. So with this, I thank my collaborators for the inspiration. I thank these institutions for their financial support, and I thank you for the attention.